welcome to the Gnostic Informant. I'm Jesus, the Logos Incarnate, and you are about to attain true gnosis. A lot of his writings, uh, pretty much everything that we have of his, we are depending on the church fathers, like people like Eusebius, to preserve that and pass it on down. According to Philo, you know, humans can't achieve salvation on their own, right? And that the only way that we can achieve that through a, a divine relationship with a divine being. According to Philo, like salvation hinges on the, the ability for us to access the gifts of wisdom we should seek first wisdom like that's that's what he considers a, a virtuous life it's not seeking ye first the kingdom of god it's not seeking ye first jesus only wisdom can save you now the logos isn't just a word it's not just a, a spoken word or a written word or anything like that it's like an ultimate library all, all in one it's like a thumb drive with all the knowledge in the world that you can just plug into you know? Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm joined by Dr. Jim Majors, who is you're like the, the prodigy of uh, biblical scholarship. You know, the, the, the next generation, the young, up-and-coming, highly qualified, well-read guy who knows what he's talking about. So I'm glad to have you on. Uh, definitely young and up and coming, but a prodigy. Uh, if if I'm the prodigy, then, then we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, man. So we're gonna talk about Philo, Philo, Judeus or Philo of Alexandria, however you want to call him, is a Jew who lived in Alexandria in the late first century BC, early first century AD, and he wrote a lot. This is like that's a lot of stuff right there. And this is only this is only what we have. Who knows what we what we lost? He could have wrote more than this. And um, so yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything about Philo, and I'll ask you a couple questions and we'll go from there. I mean, no, I mean that's uh, that's really, I mean, correct. I mean, we don't have a whole lot of his writings. Uh, pretty much everything that we have of his, we uh, are depending on the church fathers, like people like Eusebius, uh, to uh, to preserve that and pass it on down. So. In a way, we have his writings, and in and in a way, we have the writings as uh, the people who preserved them wanted them to be preserved. True, that's very true. And as a result of that, you have a lot of, and not saying that they interpolate or anything or anything like that, but the the text that they saved seems to be very um, Neoplatonic Judaism type stuff. You know what I'm saying? And very convenient. Very convenient for Christianity is what I'm getting at. Yeah. And sure. um, and so he talks about stuff that sounds like Christianity. When I'm like someone like me is reading it, he's talking about, for example, the God of being of nature of three. And he even wrote a book itself. It's, I don't know if it's a book or a chapter, but it's called Who is the Divine Heir of All Things? In which he talks about God being, or a son, I think he says son of God. I'm not sure if he's a son of God, but. He talks about there being a divine logos who's going to be the heir of God, the Father. So my question is, what do you do? You think this is influencing the early Christian writers? Oh yeah, for, certainly. I think uh, that Philo greatly influences them so much so that they uh, they consider him a, a church father. They end up uh, um, adopting him in, so to speak. Uh, it's kind of a uh, a Kent Hovind PhD, if you will. <laughs> so, and okay, so when does that exactly happen? I, I didn't even know. I, I actually have heard that before, but I didn't know if it was true. When does that So, uh, starting in the second century, um, going on through the 16th century, um, in that period, that's when you see Philo only being preserved in Christian writings. Um, he's no longer being preserved in Jewish text. Um, he's or anything that's that's outside of of Christianity, um, so that's 
not to say that, that that his text didn't exist or that there's text that would, you know, uh, possess contrary ideas to what the ones that the church fathers were trying to uh, perpetuate. But uh, that's that's the period that we see his popularity growing is between the second and 16th century. Uh, and you start to see him not just gaining popularity, but gaining authority in his writings. Yeah, that's a good point. And so he's writing, I believe he's writing in Greek. Does he write, does he write in Hebrew at all? Or is it just Greek? Nope. Just, just Greek that I'm, well, that I'm aware of, but then again, that's all that's preserved. So, I mean, we don't, again, we don't know. Interesting. And, um, so my question is now Philo, where is he getting his idea? Where is he coming up with these ideas of Neoplatonism trying to, he's looking around, he's, he's writing about Plato. He's writing about Diogenes of Sinope and he's, it looks like he's trying to put everything together and make it sense of the world. But do you think that he's the, he sort of started that or do you think he's getting it from somewhere else? Um, well, I mean, the way he started it, he started it in this particular milieu, I, I, I think. Um, he, if not started it, he certainly popularized it. So he's introducing the ideas of Greek philosophy, um, the methodologies of, of analyzing Greek literature. Um, so in the same way that the Homeric texts are being interpreted, uh, you know, allegorically, and they're being used to, uh, they're being, the interpretation is being molded and interpreted differently in order to fit different situations. So Philo does the same thing with the Jewish scriptures, uh, which, you know, prior to this point hadn't been done. Um, so even though he holds a great reverence for these texts, just like any other Jew would, he, unlike other Jews, is uh, is not holding to a, a literal interpretation. Obviously, Christianity adopts his, his trinity and his logos and all those concepts. But why do you think the Jews sort of rejected it? And like, is that... Because do you think he'd be he was like a fringe Jewish philosopher at this time, or or is this was what he doing was what everyone else in Egypt was doing at the time? Well, there's kind of two schools of thought here. Um, some people think that Philo was just trying to like synchronize these two, you know, uh, these two sects, you know, uh, just these Jewish Christians and and traditional Judaism or Judaism as it was practiced in the Second Temple, rather. Um, and there's another school of thought that thinks that it, it, quite contrary to that, that he is trying to divide the two. He's trying to create a schism and he's trying to, you know, to make it to where they are no longer identified with, with each other. Um, and I think that that was where a lot of the aversion from the Jewish population comes from was, uh, him not so much apologizing for Judaism anymore, but rather uh, resorting to allegorical interpretations in order to suit his narrative, in order to further perpetuate these these new ideas that were being popularized. Yeah, that's a I, I, that's really important that you just said that because that that's kind of what Philo does is he's allegorizing the Jewish Bible in a way, and. Um, do you, th uh, what I'm getting at is, so do you think that he was trying to make a, 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 a Judaism that was fit for the whole Roman empire? Or do you think he was trying to change the mind of his fellow Jews in Jerusalem or, or maybe both? Um, I think he was just of the mind that I don't think he was trying to proselytize. I think that he was just trying to create his own lane, so to speak. And I don't think he really... That's true. I don't think he really ultimately cared whether or not his fellow Jews followed him. Um, I think that he really fed on the uh, the attention that he was getting from the people who were accepting him, who were accepting these these new um, Hellenistic uh, um, influences, so to speak. And now, um, now Eusebius mentions him meeting Peter or something like that. Is this true or no? No, I, I, I don't, I don't believe it is. I think that that's, it's probably false. Um, I think it's probably just a, a, a legend, um, you know, much like, you know, 
Paul saying that he met Peter or something like that. It's just a, I think it's just a way to give him authority being as he had no prior connection to the, uh, to that, the apostolic church or to Jesus or uh, anything like that. I'm from what I've gathered, there hasn't been any evidence that actually happened, but that's right. the thing that Eusebius made, not that far fetched for Eusebius to make up something like he's made up a bunch of stuff, you know? And, um, so, five, mm -hmm. so do you think that he was aware of Christianity, early Christianity at all? Or do you think that this is, was so small and so fringe that he never even heard of it? Because he never mentions Christianity. He mentions the esteem. Yeah, Go ahead. Right. And that, that's interesting because he talks about being at, you know, this, at this, this geographical location where it was supposed to be, you know, the, 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 the jumping off point in Christianity is supposed to be where it's happening and where it's hot. And this is where everybody who's, you know, supporters of Christianity, this is where they're going and what they're talking about. And if they go there and they talk to somebody, well, they're going to tell somebody else about it because that automatically grants them additional authority. Um, yet we don't see him talking about meeting any Christians or being impressed by Christianity or their, their, their populations or anything like that. It's almost as if Christian, uh, Christianity didn't exist to him, almost as if it was just another, uh, just another Jewish offshoot that wasn't worth, uh, wasn't worth, wasn't worth mentioning. Right. Because, uh, Eusebius mentions that the book of Mark was written in Egypt. I don't know if he says Alexandria, Egypt, but he says Egypt. And he says that it was Mark writing under Peter. Like Peter's mm -hmm. telling him what to write, basically. And that's right, like he's a translator. Right. So you would think that if this was going on, then there had to have been some sort of population of Christians around that. Why would they just be two random Christians hanging out in Egypt writing gospels when there's no one else that in there in there with the sharing a worldview or you know similar to them? So uh, that's a weird thing right there. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I mean, you have Jewish population there, but um, big Jewish um, population. Big. Yeah. Jewish, yeah. Which is which? I mean, that's what I'm, that sort of makes sense to me for for it to be true because this type of Jewish population is Hellenized, like like Philo. So these are they're not really they're not caring too much about the temple Judaism. They're more like it's a different type of Judaism. It's a more of a globalist, uh, you know, universal Judaism, I guess you would call it. So I guess you can say it makes sense that that would be the soil for Christianity to grow out of. If that makes sense. But um, yeah. it's so fascinating Absolutely. that Philo, if you look at his life, he lived before and after the events of Jesus, and you would think that he would mention them. It's just kind of fascinating. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's uh, a text that of his. Um, you have to forgive me; I don't recall what it is right off the top of my head. But he talks about going to Jerusalem to uh, to to make a sacrifice and to to pray. It's it's unclear if he's attending one of the the three necessary uh, yearly festivals or, or not, or it may just be a regular sacrifice. Um, and at this time, you know, all of the, the apostles who are still alive, you know, the, uh, certainly the new Testament authors would be doing the same thing. They would, they would be going to the, the same temple. Um, right. But, uh, um, and like in, in Mark, uh, speaking of Mark in Mark 11 and in Acts three, it, talks about this uh, this place of prayer and that the that that everybody goes to but uh, Philo never mentions meeting with him even though you would expect you know Philo if he's going there specifically for you know for religious purposes that he would he would meet up with these with the with these Christians if if he uh, was aware or interested in their movement yeah that's a good point, actually. And I wonder, because and a lot of times Christians, if you talk, if you ask them, like, you know, well, why don't why do you think Philo never mentions Christ? Well, he's living in Egypt, and this is in Jerusalem. Well, it's like Egypt's not that far away from Jerusalem, like Alexandria, Egypt. It's far. I get it. It's not like it's right there. They're not like they're talking to him every day, but it's not that right. far where they're not hearing what's going on in those two areas. So you would think there would be some travelers going back and forth relaying messages 
pretty more frequent, probably more frequent between G- Egypt and Jerusalem than than Jerusalem and let's say like Greece or something. It's right oh, there. Absolutely. Yeah. You know I mean? like, like you said, don't, Greece, all around the Mediterranean, all around the the western, northern, and and eastern uh, uh, coast of the Mediterranean, like there were there was you know. Christian communities popping up and churches popping up uh, um, so early so that that Paul's even interesting some. Yeah, exactly. And um, in Egypt, where is where I guess was one of the big prime regions where this was taking off. You know, right. the, Cop- the Coptic Church starts up there, and um, correct. And so Philo Philo is interesting to me because he is like it. It almost feels like you're reading Christian. Uh, you're reading Christian. Christianity without Jesus, like he, he's talking about the logos. He's talking about, you know, the father. He's talking about God as being a father. You don't really see that until this time period. You don't really see right. that, like in the Old Testament. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not. If I'm the, the prophets and Isaiah and Moses, they're not saying the father. They're just saying uh, Yahweh or the Lord. Not I don't even know if it's the Lord, but Yahweh or El or something. You know. The father becomes like this thing where it turns into like Christ, that's what the Christians use because there's the father and the son. Yeah, it, it's almost to me, it seems like he's adopting their language or vice versa, and that certain terms are getting conflated with each other. Um, you know, like um, when Philo's talking about, uh, uh, you know, today you are my son, I have begotten you, or, you know, he, he takes that begotten, you know, instead of being like a conception kind of thing or some sort of a, a, uh, you know, a paternal reference, it's uh, like a, a creator reference, a creation reference. So instead of Jesus being, or instead of there being a, a, a son of God that comes from the father, it's rather the father who is creating this son and then creating a world through his son. Right, and he uses the term logos, which is uh, right. found in the Neoplatonist Pythagorean uh, circles. And uh, he even, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I read that in here, that he said something along the lines of Plato being divinely inspired when he wrote Timaeus. Um, I could be wrong, though. Yeah, well, he, he believes that that all of the, <clears throat> I mean, this is how how he interpreted the, uh, the, the Jewish scriptures up until this point, uh, is that he... He saw it like the these Greek philosophers who were gleaning ideas from the cosmos, who were gleaning ideas from divine revelation that they didn't quite understand, but they were trying to express it in in a way that not only they could understand, but that they could teach other people. And that's kind of the same way that he characterizes the the authors of these of the the Hebrew scriptures is that. They were just merely a conduit, but an insufficient one uh, to to fully uh, relay and to fully convey the uh, the the desired message. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's 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 pretty much what he was getting at. And he knows this. You can tell he knows his history too. He's he ha- probably has access to a library of vast amount of papyri and books and. Because he's talking about Diogenes of Sinope, he's talking about Aristotle, Pythagoras, he's talking about, sure. and, and he, so he's clearly immersed in the Western Roman Greco world, you know what I mean? And he's very educated. Very educated, yeah. And it's very fascinating, and I'm not surprised that Christians look to him for sort of a, a background for their theology, sort of some someone to reference and um, even take from and take ideas from. Um, yeah. And so I want to I want to ask you that about the, a lot of mythicists talk about Philo. And I'm pretty sure Doctor Carrier said this, but I don't want to quote him because I could be wrong. Hopefully, I, hopefully I am wrong because I don't know if he said this or not. But <laughs> I've heard other mythicists say that Philo mentions a, a, a archangel named Jesus. And I look, I've been I've been reading this for a little bit now. I haven't found it yet. It's not in the index. It's not really on the internet. It's like some not just like some fake website. You know what I mean? But is this is there truth to this thing or no? I haven't found it yet. Um, there is a place where the, there is an archangel or it's actually the, the Logos, um, that is, um, called the name of God. Um, and, 
in one of his texts, I forget which which one it is, that that angel, that that name of God is given the, the title of, of Archangel, but I don't think that it's named Jesus or not in not in anything that I can remember. I know that it's it's identified with 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 the Logos, but I, I yeah, I know don't that recall it being identified with Jesus. I, I would have to agree one hundred percent because I know I've I've, been, I've found what you were talking about with the with the logos being the divine heir of all things, being like the kingdom being given over to the logos. But it doesn't say Jesus; it just says the no, logos. It, right. It's, it's the angel of, of God's name. It's God's wisdom. Uh, it's the the logos Sophia. It's yes. divine wisdom. Yeah, which is very Gnostic if you actually think about it. The Gnostics probably could have been inspired by this because Sophia is like a really important aspect of gnostic uh theology or you know not, I, I know gnosticism is sort of a, like a a word that we sort of paint a brush over a bunch of different groups but like in some circles um i think it's justin the gnostic who says that sophia actually gave birth to the logos which is like i mean the gnostics don't agree on everything like marcion didn't think that marcion had, had a whole different idea he said it was the demiurge that created everything so it's like the gnostics don't agree on anything basically but the Sophia thing, because that's another as Philo talks about the Sophia a lot in this, like what is the wisdom? And yeah. he always and it's I don't know if I don't know if it actually in the in his manuscripts, but later translators put a capital on the S as like as like make it like a deity almost. I wonder if he meant it that yeah. well it it kind of seems that he did mean to give it some sort of a personification, you know. I, he definitely demonizes um this this concept, the concept of of wisdom. Um, I think so that it can play the role of mother um, with the Logos and so that the uh, in other places so that the the Logos and the Sophia can be identified as as one unit in, in a way or one grouping um, that together kind of are kind of like those primordial waters. You know, they are those those initial yeah. demiurges, you know. Right, right, right. And that's. And that seems to be, and that, uh, what I'm going to, what I'm getting at is this actually comes from the Old Testament itself. Like in, um, in Proverbs, when it talks about wisdom, it always says she for wisdom, her lips are pure for wisdom. Yeah. She is the greatest. It never has wisdom. He is, it's always a feminine thing, which is, so that's not like a, that's not like a her heretical thing to do. That's, that's in the Torah or not the Torah, the Tanakh. So that's, sure. he's, he's obviously getting that from there. And, um, that's, I think that's pretty interesting that I wonder if that's like a remnant of this, the, uh, Asherah, the polytheistic it, days. It's possible, especially with her identification or with her being identified with the, with a tree. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of crossover there. If we were to make a Venn diagram, there'd be a, a, a lot of crossover. Wait, is there enough crossover to where I feel comfortable saying that? You know that they you know that one stems from the other you know i'm i'm not really sure but i mean we we see a lot of a lot of these concepts being personified in in greek culture in uh in christianity in judaism uh so i i think that it's probably a little bit of a cultural remnant and a little bit of a uh a traditional remnant yeah, that's a good point. The, you, you, the, the crossovers are there, but it's almost like it's so vague that you don't know if it's that's what it is. Like you just kind of have to apply it yourself, or it's implied. It's hard to tell. But right. uh, yeah, but it's interesting. It's interesting. It's interesting that you never see wisdom as he. It's always her. Always, hundred percent right. in the Bible. So and, that and, and when when Sophia is being portrayed in both Philo's writings and in. Uh, you know, in, in Jewish texts, whether, you know, biblical or extra biblical, Sophia is given, it is almost given a role higher than that of God. Um, that Sophia is the source of wisdom that, that of, of all of God's wisdom, all of God's knowledge resides within her. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the uh, wisdom of Solomon, the apocryphal text. That's in the Catholic Bible. It's not in the the uh, canon of like you know the Protestant Bible, or it's not in the 
you know, the 66 books, you know, the, the big one, but it's in the Catholic Bible. It's actually, it's apocryphal and it's called the wisdom of so wisdom of Solomon. Right. And in chat, oh, no, no, no. it's, it's, it's deutero canonical. That's <laughs> Oh, okay. That's <laughs> it's good that you uh, pointed that out. There's a big difference, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. So Deuterocanonical. <clears throat> and uh, chapter 9 is Solomon's prayer. And right at the end, he says, we're saved by Sophia. Which is like, what? Chris, that's for a Christian. You're not saved by wisdom. You're saved by faith. So anyways, no wonder, no wonder why this didn't make the cut. And then right after that, I'm not even joking, the next, the next sentence in chapter 10, says that Sophia preserved, preserved the first formed father of the world when he alone had been created. <laughs> what? Did you just tell me that the father was created? Yeah. By a woman? Right. <laughs> Crazy. But it, that's just in like, the beginning was, was wisdom and it was good. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, that is so fat. And this is what Philo was. This was, this was around for Philo, this uh, text right here. I believe this was written like 100, 200 BC or something like this. this is one of the later texts, but yeah, this is what this is the world Philo was living in. This was like in the air, whereas there's, there's Sophia, this aspect of God of wisdom, the feminine side. And somehow it just got dropped, cut right out. But right. there's an example of it right there. Yeah. Well, with uh, according to to Philo, you know, without humans can't achieve salvation on their own, right? And that the only way that we can achieve that is through a a divine relationship uh with a divine being right and according to philo like it, he seems to be saying that all of salvation hinges on the the ability for us to access the gifts of wisdom uh that we should seek first wisdom like that's that's what he considers a, a virtuous life it's not you know, seeking ye first the kingdom of God. It's not seeking ye first Jesus. You know, it's it's only wisdom can save you now. Right. And that sounds like Gnosticism, but Gnosticism is more, I guess Gnosis and wisdom are not the same thing. So it's not exactly the right. same. It almost sounds like they're getting towards the same, like getting away from faith alone gives you saved, but, you know, wisdom or knowledge or Gnosis. But, um, yeah. There's, there's there's like this pre-existing wisdom tradition uh, within Judaism, uh, you know, that holds you know great importance on on wisdom and that we should search for wisdom and that um, uh, in order to, to purify ourselves we must attain wisdom. Uh, so it's kind of like a uh, you know you you set yourself on this path to seek wisdom and now that's the only thing that can save you. Wow, that's cool. Um, you know, and there's a Philo writes about so many different things. And like, he has this text called the embassy to the embassy of Gaius. And he mm -hmm. goes in depth about meeting Caligula. And he sort of, this is one of the, I think this is one of the best parts of his works where he talks about Caligula being this psychopathic dictator emperor who comes along, put my statue in your temple, worship me. And then they're like, the Jews are like, but we, we we uh we give offerings in your name to our God every day. We love you. We support you. And he says, "I." He says, "That's you have a different God than me." And I guess, guess they're all freaking out and they're all gonna. They're all think they're gonna die. I think he even does like kill a couple of them or something like that. But what do you think about Philo writing about stuff like this? You know, it's it's kind of hard to say. It uh, I think that it's it's certainly possible. I mean, I think that he you know could have been you know in an old man, you know, um, but I think the fact that, uh, if I remember correctly, um, Gaius rejects his his request, right? They, he rejects the the, the 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 Jews' petition, right? Right, right. So I I, I think that being said, that's it's kind of lends credence to the possibility that that it is you know historical because he didn't approve of it. Um, you know, it's not really something that he wanted to hear or not something that he wanted his uh his you know his students to hear i'm sure but uh, it does give it does paint a picture you know it sort of asserts what josephus later on writes about when he's saying that the jews basically said give us death rather than give us these statues because you're giving another example of 
the Jews really sticking to their guns and being like, no, we don't want this statue. We're not going to worship uh, Capital Jupiter or whatever his name is, the god of that, the god of Jupiter Capilonius or whatever. And um, they just they weren't going to do it. And they were devout worshipers of this Jehovah Yahweh. And they were not going for any of that. And the rest of the empire was like, whatever, do what you want. We'll just worship. Like there, you don't hear about this in Carthage or in Spain or in the Gaul. They're just going along. The Jews are the only ones who really, I mean, not the only ones. I guess there are rebellions. But as far as religion goes, they're the ones who are the hardest sticking to their guns and staying true to their, what they believe in. Yeah, I think it's also possible that he stayed long enough where he returned um, after Gaius died, um, and maybe to maybe he thought that Claudius would be um, would be better suited to present it to um, that he would be more likely to approve it. Um, I think I think that's possible. I think that he, I mean, it'd be kind of hard for a Jew not to see. Claudius as, you know, a little more easy handed than, than Gaius. Yeah. And so, I, mean, I, I think that's possible. Um, yeah. And it's funny because later on the, uh, the, the, the two emperors that got damn nation was, I think it was Caligula and Nero, right. Yep. Which is like, they're looking back at these events as the two harshest emperors that are on the Jews, they're saying there must have been harsh on the Christians too, which is why you get the writings of Eusebius saying all these Christians were persecuted and fed to lions. And I'm sure there's truth to that. Like, I'm sure, I, I probably think that he's probably exaggerating. I think they might be co-opting some of the Jewish history, but he could be right too. Or he could be 100% right. Could have all been Christians being um, being persecuted. But it's, it's interesting to me that the, uh, the later... Roman Empire authors and writers and historians are sort of looking back and doing and seeing the history for like in the same way the Jews would look back. Like, sure, you know what I mean? Well, well, and one thing's for certain that regardless of, you know, what they're looking back towards, it's it's clear, you know, in the rhetoric in the text and just the the things that the, that the author focuses on, you can tell that they're they're still experiencing both internal conflict within Judaism and they're facing conflict against Hellenism, this encroaching Hellenism into Judaism after they, I mean, they've been fighting it for several hundred years at this point. So it's just uh, kind of like the icing on the cake. It's just like, well, freaking great. You know, this is just <laughs> we're, we're, like, we're, we're fighting ourselves. We're fighting against them. And we're getting, we're not just fighting against them, but they're pushing back. We're getting persecuted. And it doesn't matter that we're different. They, the, 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 the people who were, who were not Jewish, they, they didn't care about the sectarianism within Judaism because it wasn't diverse enough for them to even, to even acknowledge unless they had some, you know, some experience, some knowledge of just, you know, Judaism 101 uh, or, you know, Jewishness 101, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, I mean, the, the only people that those internal conflicts bothered were the Jews. All it did was allow them to be conquered because they divided themselves and made them made themselves weaker, essentially. And the whole time, you know, both sides are griping because both sides feel like it's the other person's fault, the other side's fault that they're getting attacked by the Greeks. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, I'm sorry, by the Romans. Uh, so it's, it's really yeah. interesting. And it is interesting. It probably explains why the Jews are the only, not the only, but like one of the very few people that still have their culture intact today. Like all the other, like the, the the ancient Gauls or the ancient Scythians or Carthage, all those religions are gone. They just went along with whatever Christianity or whatever Islam took over and whatever, wherever location they were in, they sort of just went with the flow. Whereas the Jews were like, 
no matter where they were, no matter if they were in the diaspora, whether they're in Germany, whether they're in Spain or whatever, they are just sticking to their Torah and their Tanakh, and they're not. They're, that explains why they are still they kept it going. You know. Well, they also have a geographical anchor that not many religions have. They they have this this sense of homeland. You know that or motherland if you will that they can return to whether they're they're in the diaspora or not um yeah. like t take for example the uh the zoroastrians zoroastrianism is still going on today uh there are still zoroastrians um and they still hold to you know their their old traditions and it's it's I don't know. I think both of them are just a testament to the stubbornness of of man's belief of, of the power of belief. It's just it, it can be right. It can be the most dogmatic, unmoving thing in the world, or it can be just fluid and you know have have zero constitution to it. But it, it's it's really interesting to see how just how hard you have to fight to get to where they are today. Yeah. And even the Hindus who are make up a huge population of the world, they are, they, they went through being conquered by the British being conquered by the Islam and their Hinduism is still thriving over there. And you know, and so mm -hmm. I, it's, I guess that's another good example that I forgot about. And, and so this logos concept that Philo is using that seems to, get passed down to the Christians. John mentions it in John 1, in the beginning was the Logos. Um, I wonder if, I wonder if Philo wasn't the only one, wasn't the only Jewish person tossing this idea around. I mean, I wonder if, do you think, first of all, do you think he got this, he got this from, did Pl Plato is one who actually came up with this idea, right? Because Philo describes it as being the glue that holds everything together. But is that the same Logos that Plato is writing about? I honestly think he got it from the Stoics. I think he got it from um, uh, Lysimachus. Oh, really? I didn't know that. That's who. So that's yeah. that's who wrote about the logos first. Uh, well, it's not the first one, but um, the the Stoics identify the logos as reason or as like um, knowledge or, or something that you can you can base everything on. It's like a, it was like the it was like their axiom, you know. So it kind of got, I mean, necessarily, if you're going to adopt, you know, these stoicism, you're going to adopt this philosophy that there is this, this, this logos, you know, that is the, the ultimate, ultimate of everything, the end all be all. And you also have a God that's supposed to fill that same gap. It, you kind of have to merge the two. Right. And that's, it's funny that you said it because in John also later on in John, there's the spirit of truth. And I wonder if it's like the logos, the spirit of truth is like a concept of what is the true, what's true is what is needs to be put up on the, like, forget about the law. The law is great and all, but there are instances where truth will trump the law. And I, I don't know if this is what, this makes sense, but like I, I'm think I'm wondering if Christians are are trying to push this idea of a logos is like what is the uh, the the ultimate reality of what we're in is greater than some piece of paper or some book that has laws in it. Like there is an ultimate truth in certain in every situation that we're in, basically. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, with these. Hellenistic ideas that that Paul's getting from from Greek philosophy, you know, like some of these things are things like uh, like a dualist mindset, you know, that there is good and evil, that there is good and bad, that there are these these polar opposites, these forces, uh, you know, that are always moving against each other, that are kind of the balance to everything, and the the logos is is one of these and it's one of these stronger ones you know and uh the or logo sophia if, if you will um but it's while it's not clear exactly how he intends it you know we can we can see where he gets it from and how they intended it and kind of go from there but 
that it's almost like with, for him, the logos isn't just a word. It's not just a, a spoken word or a written word or anything like that. Right. It's like a, it's like an ultimate library all, all in one. It's like a thumb drive with all the knowledge in the world that you can just plug into, you know, and that's going to be a so, highlight right there. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. No, that's, that's it. No, that's such a good way to look at it. Cause it's such a hard thing to pin down because the, the word in Greek for, for word is Lexi. So logos mm -hmm. obviously is a different meaning. It's a different, we translate it as word with a capital W which is fine, but I think that we should just, I think it should just be transliterated logos because it means something else rather than word. The, but so, so I think the translation sort of loses its purpose when it comes down to the word in the beginning was the word and blah, blah, blah. But it makes sense because it is the word. It's, it's the spoken word, the vibrational, the, what's what God is saying is being thrown down and to the prophet and the prophet lives throughout, lives that out basically. So Jesus being the ultimate of the prophets, the son of God, the, the Messiah is literally the walking logos. So right. from the New Testament writer's perspective, like John, for example, when he's trying to, he's writing out these, um, these scenes where Jesus is being tested, for example, them being like, you can't pick grain on the Sabbath. And he's basically saying, well, what did David do? He's basically, he's being a master debater, master philosopher if you will, and he's just crushing everybody with his with his uh, his uh, intellect and his knowledge and his wisdom, which is what you would get from a logos, which is it's like a cool kind of superhero, if you will. Like you know what I mean? Kind of like William Lane Craig when he first released <laughs> the uh, cosmological argument. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, and it, it, I mean, it's important, you know, just as with any word in any language that you know you were talking about transliterating it just as logos you know and I, I agree with that in a lot of places but it's important to look at it in context too what you know what are the words around it is there something being you know de describing it because to to philo there's not just you know the the logos you know but there is the communication of that 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 language you know you that that uh this logos in diathetos, this uh, this voice inside your head that you're talking to God, or the uh, the uh, logos prophoricos, uh, the uh, the actual the actual spoken word, you know, so these these really important things that are being uh, that are being expressed. That are coming from God or coming from a a divine being, um, you know, it's like what, what kind of what I was talking about earlier about him justifying the uh, the way that he allegorically uh, interprets the the Hebrew text is because he believes that while it's divinely inspired and divinely transferred, and that the words that are being written down are 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 divine and inerrant that there's also more to them, that there's a message that not even the communicator knew just because they didn't, they didn't have the, uh, the logos in diathetos, you know, they, they were given the guidance, but they weren't given the full meaning. Right. That's a good point. And so this whole logos concept, the uh, Plutarch, he wrote a, a book called on Isis and Osiris. And he calls Osiris the Logos in this book. Um, Interesting. So, yeah. So you have another. So this 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 idea is being tossed around. I know that in the Egyptian mythology, uh, Thoth, who's also Hermes in Greek mythology, is called the Word. I don't know if it was that. I don't know if they said Logos because I know I know Egyptian is a little bit different than Greek, but he is called the Word over there. So the, this is like sort of a concept that was. Uh, tossed around, I guess. And I know Mithras is known as a mediator. And he's also a, in the, not the, I don't know about the Roman, maybe it is the Roman one, but the Persian one. He is, um, he's a mediator between Ahura Mazda and Angermanu. Yeah. Because those are the two. He's, a, he's a messenger. 
Yeah. So he, in a way, you can sort of, you can sort of look and, and I'm not saying this is what it is, but you sort of sounds like the part of the logos in a way, because he's in between both. He's sort of, uh, he's being the logos, the glue. That's like, like, like Philo said, glue sticking everything together. You have Mithra in the middle. Mm -hmm. Now, now, they didn't call him the logos, but I'm saying, I, you can make a case that it can be perceived that way. Now, I don't want to. Well, it's kind, of, it's kind of like saying it's kind of like the difference between an anointed one and the anointed one. You yeah. know, you can have logos, and then you can have the logos. That's a really good point. Yeah, because there's a lot of little anointed ones in the Old Testament, like David. David's called a Messiah, but it's like you said, it's the small M Messiah. It's just a Messiah. He's and he gets anointed right. by what is it? It's, nah, Samuel anoints him, right? But the anointed one is the one who's anointed by by the baptism, right? The holy, whatever. Well, and, well yeah, the, the the anointed one is the one who is prophesied, who is to come, who is going to be either you know a a a high priest or a king or some some uh, prophet or some major figure. Uh, that's kind of who, who they were expecting in in the anointed one. But an anointed one can be somebody who just spilled olive oil on her shoe um, <laughs> exactly yeah that's a good point and that is just that so when you when you when you put it in the context of what we're what we're just talking about it's not that it's not that surprising that christianity took off the way it did i mean i know it took a while but it's not that surprising to me that it's it, it spreaded at the rate it did and became so popular because it sort of it sort of grasped it sort of has its hands and everything like somebody who's a follow somebody who's a, G, a greek like follower of dionysus is like would would be someone prone to liking the ideas of christianity or somebody in egypt uh, worshiping dionysus who hears about this logos character who actually really lived and he was oh did you hear he was resurrected it's not that surprising that this idea would take off because it seems to have similarities around the Roman Empire in different in different religions. Sure. And it's something that was so close to their time. Like it, it just happened. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't think of anything else right now. This has been phenomenal. Um, do you have any, anything else? You, is there any other, actually I'll just ask you this. Is there any other parts of Philo that I didn't mention that seem very Christian like that we forgot to mention? Or did we cover all that? I think we did. I, I would I would say that his popularity with people like Origen and Clement of Alexandria, I think, and Eusebius, I think that lends a lot of credence to the idea that he was accepted early on as a Christian, um, if not in his in his lifetime. But once they, once the writings of, of Philo circulated through the the authorities within, you know, this this developing, you know community I, I think he gained authority very quick because he i mean let's be honest he's he's a wordsmith Philo is 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 great with words and he also had a way of harmonizing neoplatonism with judaism something that you know that that i think that the jewish apostles and that the the early apostolic church would have a problem doing um just with their lack of experience. So I think that Philo did him a huge favor and in reading his text, they they said, man, this guy, we can use this guy. This is this is our salesman right here. You know, we need to push his text. He, he, he just said it better than we ever could. So let's just, you know, acquiesce to a few little things that we, we need to. Let's only perpetuate what text support, you know, support us and support our beliefs and our agendas and uh philo is going to be the next church father a a christian post-mortem yeah and that's you're so right like he is the perfect reference for the early christian church fathers to go back to and say look there's some really educated jews that were writing about this stuff Neoplatonism is already a popularized idea. You're trying to sell it to the Neoplatonists anyway. So who's better that who's better to go to than Philo himself? And like Philo or, or like Josephus, Philo's, I think it's his daughter or his son marries Agrippa's son or daughter, one or the other. 
or some, something along the lines. Agrippa, of Agrippa, I believe. Yeah. So that tells you right there that he's marrying into the Roman Empire at a high level. So his descendants probably had some influence. Maybe were Christian converts. Who knows? Right. And would, not just among the, the common people. You know, his word would have influence with people who had money and people who had influence. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, it's like the Flavians adopting Josephus. And I'm sure he, I don't know what happened with his descendants or anything, but I'm sure some of them might have been in the church or whatever, you know, who knows? Like, I'm sure there's something there. I'm not, I'm like, I, we don't really know. We lost it all, but, or right. he may, maybe he had no kids. I don't know. I don't know if you know about that, but yeah. <laughs> who uh, knows? Well, but. it's like, it, it's like Constantine with, uh, with, with Arianism, you know, it, it, he, by allowing it, whether it was out of ignorance or out of, you know, just uh, pure heresy, he he gave it power, you know, he gave it authority and allowed it to continue for, you know, centuries more than it uh, it would have been able to on its own without without endorsement, even though it wasn't, you know, I wouldn't say it's a direct or a purposeful endorsement to that specific, you know, practice, uh, you know, speaking of Arianism, but I think that uh, it, that without it, without that, that um, recommendation without that that support behind him, even if it's just something as small as Constantine being baptized by an Arian priest, it, it 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 speaks power to it because it's Constantine. It's somebody in a high position of power. It's not like an apostle writing it. You know, even though that would give that would have authority to an already believer that does nothing for the potential convert. Absolutely. Yeah, that's such a good point because that's that's as big as it gets. It's constant. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I took the long way around that. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. I'm glad you did that. And um, I was trying to think of if I had anything that I wanted to ask. But, oh yeah, Arian, real quick. Arian is this the same Arian that writes the uh, the life of Alexander the Great, or is this a different Arian? A different Arian. A different Arian. Okay, because yeah, I know it's that's confusing, isn't it? Yeah, it's not uh, A R R I A N. Um, is the the historian uh, Arius is the the founder of Arianism? Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. And so now and he was a a priest in Egypt in uh, in Alexandria. True. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Now you're reminding me. Okay. Yeah. And so because Ar- the reason why I get those two mixed up is because Arian, the one that wrote the life of Alexander the Great, he also mm-hmm. wrote a, a wisdom book. I don't know what it was called, but it was like a a, like a stoic book, like sort of like a meditations book that was that ended up being used as by a lot of church fathers as well as stoics, like like um, Marcus Aurelius was big into it. But I just thought that that's why I, when I hear that, I get the two names mixed up just because of that alone. Like you're thinking a guy named Arian who had some influence on the church, and then Arius who actually was the founder of Arianism. So it's like for someone like me who's not as educated and not as well, if we're burst on all this. I immediately get mixed up with those two, but I'm glad that we got to uh, clear that out real quick. Yeah, I think it might be the um, um, the uh, Enchiridion or the um, might be like dissertations and discourses, maybe. Yeah, that's what that was. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, and uh, this has been awesome. This is been a really fun interesting conversation and I'm definitely awesome, gonna, man. definitely got to do it again sometime for sure i'm glad i could uh answer all all of your questions i was i was worried that uh i uh it, they'd been too long <laughs> oh this is great this is perfect actually and um awesome jim majors you have a youtube channel is there any other sites i put the youtube channel in the description and i have a comment on it is there anywhere anywhere else you want to point to people for anything else you got going on um, I mean, really, if you just subscribe to my YouTube channel and watch a couple of videos, I'd appreciate it. If you want to follow me on Twitter, um, I'm on there quite a bit. My handle is at the Jim Majors. Nice. There it is, guys. And you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.